Hello, I'm John Bowen and this is a brief introduction to normal territorial behaviour in cats, focusing mostly on the characteristics which are relevant to common behavioural problems in cats like indoor elimination and spray marking. And the first thing to consider is the territorial layout that cats use. There are two main areas of the territory. The first is the peripheral territory, which is the boundary that contains all of the uh, major resources that the cat uses. And that includes a large number of hunting areas that the cat will use and um, a large number of latrine sites that the cat will use as well. And towards the centre of this um, territory, there's a second area called the core territory. And this is where the cat's resting and feeding places are located. Now it's important to remember that all of these activities are solitary. Cats are solitary hunters. They use their own separate latrine sites which are separate from other cats, usually using individual faeces and urine um, latrine locations. And their resting and feeding places are also used um, individually. And this is important because cats are solitary hunters. They don't rely on other cats to assist them in their hunting behaviour. And when they're within this boundary that they've territorialised, they don't expect to come in contact with any cats that are um, unfamiliar to them or part of another group. So it means they can move freely around within their peripheral territory, relying on the scent marks that they've used at the boundaries to prevent other cats from entering. Now to give a rough idea of what the sizes of these territories are in wild and feral cats, typically the core territory is something around 100 metres in diameter and the peripheral territory is around a half to 1.3 kilometres along the side if it's an oblong shape and that equates to something around um, 300,000 to 1.7 million square metres which is a very large area. And although cats can't move any of the items that are in their territory around, they do organise the way that they utilise territory to optimise certain characteristics. And the first of those is hygiene. So cats will locate their latrine sites within a convenient distance of a resting and hunting area, but not close enough that it's going to um, increase the risk of contamination or disease spread. And they also try to optimise security. So although on this diagram it looks like the core territory is very close to the boundary of the peripheral territory, it might be um, that that's more than 100 metres um, distance. So in fact, um, what we would normally expect is that the peripheral territory boundary is beyond the um, visual distance of the cat. So it wouldn't expect, while it's in its core territory, to be able to see um, another cat that is not part of its group or is a potential neighbour or competitor. So within the core territory, cats don't expect to be able to even see other cats from other groups. And the last thing is convenience. We might think that from a cat's point of view, it's good to have the largest possible territory, but actually that ends up being um, very inefficient and a waste of time. It's much better to hold a territory which is compact and contains all of the really important territorial features and resources that the cat needs so that it can move from one activity to another without expending too much energy. And so this enables the cat to locate um, latrine sites, at a reasonable distance to hunting sites and resting sites so that it's easy for the cat to move from hunting to a latrine site and then back to hunting again. And this is the most efficient way of dealing with things so it's, it's preferable for cats to have a high density of resources within a smaller area rather than a low density of resources in a larger area. And the next thing to consider is the territorial activity of cats. This is mostly focusing on the use of spray marks and claw marks to control access to territory. And this is the way that cats manage to avoid um, coming in direct contact with each other and the way that they uh, manage to maintain distance from one another. So if we look at these two neighbouring territories of cats, there's an area which is almost overlapping between those two territories towards the middle of the screen. And in that location, because cats... Um, from both territories might occasionally need to be in that in that area maybe it's a through way to get between different parts of a territory then um, they need to be able to manage use of that territory to avoid coming in contact with each other and this is what they do um, uh, using spray marks so spray marks are a way of indicating that a cat is entering um, an area of, uh, of disputed territory or shared territory and therefore it might come across another unfamiliar cat and it needs to be aware of what time other cats are using that location in order to avoid that conflict. 
and claw marks are a much more definite boundary. They really indicate um, the, the stronger edge of the um, of the cat's territory. So if a cat is entering another area and comes across claw marks, it's going to be aware that it's directly going into a space where it might come across the resident cat and end up in a conflict. Within the core territory areas this is where cats use face and flank marks not only to indicate to themselves that this is a place of safety but also to indicate to other cats that this is a, um, a, a shared territory that the group uses and that all of the cats that encounter each other in that location um, should be familiar to each other. Now if we look at the way that cats move around their territory they tend to follow relatively um, um, fixed paths going to the same locations repeatedly on a daily basis to um, scent mark and claw mark and to hunt. So if we look at the movement of the cat in the left hand territory it leaves its core territory and goes to this area of spray marking and leaves a series of deposits of spray mark along that location at a particular time of day and then it leaves that area. At the same time, the cat in the right-hand territory is leaving claw marks around its territorial boundary before eventually coming into that same area of territory to carry out its own spray marking. Now, by the time it arrives in that location, which might be two or three hours after the other cat has left, then those spray marks are beginning to degrade. That's indicated by the change of colour on the diagram. So this indicates to the cat from the right-hand territory that the other cat was present two or three hours ago and therefore it's safe to enter this area. And what will happen is this cat will enter and leave its own set of spray marks. So if both cats respect this spray marking behaviour, then we end up with them being able to use common areas of territory without coming face to face with each other. So claw marks prevent cats um, uh, um, getting close to each other in space and spray marks help to um, enable them to avoid each other in time. So they're able to completely avoid each other and therefore uh, um, prevent direct conflict. Next thing we need to think about is the hunting and feeding behaviour of cats. Typically cats will spend something like six to eight hours a day hunting and during that time they'll make around 100 or more attempts to catch prey of which only around 10 to 20 are successful and result in a small meal. And the cat may not consume all of the food that they catch, they may eat part of the prey and then bury the remaining part of prey in some loose sandy soil to desiccate um, so that the cat may then be able to eat that later on, although cats generally prefer to eat live fresh prey. What's very important is that hunting and feeding behaviour are independently motivated. So cats will hunt, catch prey, consume it and then return to hunting again immediately. Even if they feel relatively full or satiated, they still continue to hunt. Um, and that's important because um, we tend to um, think that cats will eat um, large amounts of food in one go and then rest, but in fact their normal activity is to eat very small amounts, snack on the go and return to activity again. So next thing we need to um, consider um, the domestic situation and what kinds of constraints are applied to normal cat behaviour um, in a domestic environment. And there are three main areas of problems. The first is reduced space. The second is overpopulation. That's not just in the local area, but also within the household. And lastly, conflict over resources, which tends to result from this combination of reduced space and overpopulation. So if we look at this typical set of, um, of homes um, adjacent to each other, on average in the UK the size of a two-storey three-bedroom house is around 88 metres square and the typical size of a UK garden is about 151 metres squared. Now from um, observation studies in cats we know that the actual size of pet cats territory can be quite large can be anything up to 47,000 square metres, which is clearly much larger than the area of territory provided by the owner's own garden and home. So this means that cats are likely to be accessing a patchwork of areas of territory around their neighbourhood, moving from one location to another through the gardens of other cats and utilising the resources and hunting opportunities that are dotted around quite a large area. 
And this raises a number of problems. Firstly, um, it's likely that cats are going to cross each other's territory in, in clear view of core territory in order to get from one location to another. And as we said at the beginning, it's completely unusual for cats to encounter or see unfamiliar cats when they themselves are in their core territory. Their peripheral territory shouldn't generally be invaded by other cats. And secondly, it's quite common in um, domestic settings for a home not to provide um, suitable borders, earth for a cat to dig in, in order to create a latrine. So it's quite common for cats to have to leave their own garden in order to find a latrine location in another cat's territory. And both of these are likely to lead to an increased risk of conflict. The next issue to look at is um, resources within the home. Now we've already said that um, cats arrange the way that they um, have their latrine sites um, and their feeding locations so that they manage them and maintain high levels of hygiene. When in a domestic environment it's quite common for resources to be inappropriately located. So as in this case, feeding bowls that are in a convenient location for the owner but right next to a latrine site that the cat's using or latrine and feeding sites which are right next to a territorial boundary like a cat flap. And this breaks the kind of hygiene and security rules that cats set up for themselves and also it means that in a, um, a group living environment those resources may be inadequate for those cats as well. So if we have four cats in the household, one litter tray isn't adequate for them, one feeding site isn't adequate because those cats would expect to use those facilities independently of one another. Anything which encourages cats to have to queue behind each other or wait for access to a resource is likely to lead to a degree of stress. Then if we look at the feeding behaviour of cats in a domestic setting, around 45% of cats in the UK appear to be fed ad-lib, so they have free access to food whenever they want it. But more than 50% are either fed um, meals, so a couple of meals a day, or they're fed on demand. One of the problems with on-demand feeding is that the owners are not necessarily present um, at all times, so that means the cat is reliant on the owner as a source of food. Now if we think about meal feeding, two meals a day for a cat is something like a person being fed only every second or third day, remembering that in the wild they would normally eat 10 to 20 small meals a day. So this means that cats are going to have periods when they overconsume in the morning and evening and then have limited access to the food. Um, even though their normal behaviour would be to be snacking throughout the day, mixing that with other activities like hunting and territorialising. And this lack of food um, can drive cats to find food elsewhere. Now it may be possible for them to scavenge food in the local area or it may even be possible for them to hunt. But in many cases the easiest source of food is actually to um, look for food in the homes of other neighbouring cats that are vulnerable. So if there's no lockable cat flap it's very easy to um, see food in another cat's household and therefore it's an open invitation um, for a home invasion which is likely to lead to even greater conflict. So that's a, a, the brief summary over. Um, all of the information that um, has been in this talk is um, also available in Wikivet and if you're interested in getting more information on cat behaviour um, we have a comprehensive set of pages in Wikivet on cat behaviour that includes normal behaviour and also problem behaviour and how to deal with it. And in the next talk I'm going to go on and discuss um, indoor spray marking in cats um, based on some of the information that we've already covered. So hopefully you've enjoyed this talk and um, you'll come back for the next segment. Thanks very much for listening.